This is a relay project. The discourse starts right now with Cheryl Oates and Erica Barudis. Welcome back to a special Friday edition of The Discourse. Today we are talking all things Alberta Budget 2024. Premier Danielle Smith and the United Conservative government introduced a budget with some pretty big structural changes to the way Alberta operates with a vision of getting Alberta off the revenue roller coaster and less dependent on revenue from oil and gas to balance its budget and fund public services. Well, I think a vision is a great way to describe it, as this budget is the definition of smoke and mirrors, all talk, very little action. Eric and I are going to get into our thoughts a little later on the show. We're going to have an actual expert. We're going to have Alberta economist Andrew Leach join us for his analysis. Well, I think you gave us a little uh, line of sight of how you feel about this, Cheryl. I think you were like <laughs> giggling as I was reading, like talking my part. But um, first, let's kick off with uh, what the Minister of Finance, Nate Horner, had to say yesterday in his budget speech. It's a budget that strikes a balance. It addresses the needs of Alberta families, builds and protects safe communities, manages our resources wisely, and supports businesses that are the backbone of our economy. At the same time, it's built on our fiscal framework, which ensures paying down debt remains a priority. This is a budget based on the same priorities held by many Albertans who create their own household budgets. Albertans who have also had to make tough choices to take care of the needs of the family, make their mortgage payments, and hopefully save for the future. I mean, it sounds good. But when you actually look at the numbers, I don't think there's a lot of this there. Like the government can't even be honest about whether they have a surplus or a deficit. I would say I think that there are some things that they're doing right, but I I wasn't uh, wooed by the entire budget. So like what what specific um, funding or the numbers that you're talking about? Where do you want to where do you want to dig into this? Well, I mean, we can just start with honesty about the government's financial position. Like we're looking at a very, very marginal uh, surplus, which seems to be there as a symbolic piece only because when the numbers shake out, I think it's very unlikely that the government ends up with a surplus in this budget year and the budget year that they're projecting um, because their expenses exceed their revenue. So this is basic math. Like we don't end up with a surplus if our expenses exceed our revenue. And I mean, some of the contingency planning they've done just doesn't add up with previous years. And I think we're going to end up spending a lot more than what's forecast in the budget. I think we'll have to wait to see how that plays out. I know that in the contingency budget, uh, usually especially around natural um, disasters and things like forest fires or droughts, and and we've seen a lot of that talk from the government. So I think that they have built in a good contingency plan. Um, But you also have to understand how the fiscal framework plays into this. And I want to pick Andrew Leach's brain a little bit on, you know, the the money that has to go to debt repayment and has to go into uh, the, the Heritage Savings Trust Fund. And so what does that mean for how we now see surplus being different? Um, And what revenue are we actually expecting and how conservative are they being given um, this shift in in some of the revenues we're going to see? Like it's going to be a tough year of revenues coming in. Your government with the NDP lived under it. Um, This is one that at least they can say that there is plan for a surplus as opposed to a huge deficit. I mean, there is a catastrophic difference in the price of commodity uh, prices and the price of oil. But I mean, we can put facts aside if we want to say the Alberta NDP managed this more poorly. The Alberta NDP had record low oil prices and uh, the the UCP has been governing with pretty high oil prices and relative to that time still record or relatively high oil prices now. But Erica, I have to say. Your tone is kind of surprising me because I expected you to come in here like guns blazing. What a great job the UCP has done following through on their promises, being so prudent and responsible. And I don't know, you're pretty measured, especially for you. (laughs) I'd like you to explain that last point a little bit more, please. Just kidding. I never want that on the record of how you you think my normal measurement is. Um, I think it's a few things. So I'm I'm through and through a conservative. Uh, I think a lot of the things the government promised in advance um, 
I think the hard thing I'm, I'm swallowing is actually the not implementing the 8%. And mm -hmm. I think if I am sitting at that cabinet table and what you see in this budget is, and again, like this is just my, my, my viewpoint now from where I sit outside, um, they, it looks like they were addressing inflation and population growth. And, and it was, you have to do one or the other, that or the, the tax cut that they promised in the election. You can't do it all. And that's what happens when you have a tight budget year and you have to live within your means. And I'm all for savings. I'm all for debt repayment. Like that's where my fiscal conservative comes in. But I think it's interesting that that's the route that they pick to go as opposed to putting money back in conservatives uh, or sorry, putting money back <laughs> like conservatives do. There we go. That was the right one. Um, into the pockets of Albertans. So I think that's one thing that, especially when we look at what the premier's address was the week before, um, something that I was actually quite surprised that was the decision they were taking. Yeah, for me, like personally, even as an Albertan politics aside, if we have a government that ran on, and it really was sort of like a the, one of the biggest throws of the UCP campaign, runs on bringing in a new tax bracket at a time when people are really struggling with affordability, to see that walked back, not just until next year, but actually until the next election, it felt deeply duplicitous to say we're not we, we ran on it this time. Perhaps some of you voted on it this time, but we're actually going to run on it again in the next election. Like that for me was so frustrating to see. I don't think that that's fully fair to say, like the premise I agree with, but they didn't. One, you know this, when you make an election promise, you technically have the four years. So that's the reality versus perception. Um, I am surprised as someone that was part of that that campaign team wasn't what that they they were p implementing on their first budget. Because again, I think they had to pick and choose. There's a lot of promises in campaigns. There's a lot of decisions with when you have the revenue, uh, projected revenue that you're going to have, and you have to operate within your means. I don't think that that doesn't mean it's off the table for year two, three, four. The premier said, you know, we'll have to introduce it when it makes sense. So I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying that they haven't said that that's not going to come in possibly next year or the year after. No, it's it's clear in the fiscal plan that it is phased in starting in uh, the year in, in two, three years from now and then fully phased in at eight percent the year of the next election without a way to pay for it for what it's worth. Um, and I do think that it was pretty clear in the election. Like they didn't say, listen, we'll look to phase in a new tax bracket. They said, we will make, we will offer people this tax relief at a time when they need it most. And it was supposed to be in place for 2023 now as people were filing their taxes. And instead they will run on it theoretically, like, like by looking at the fiscal plan, they'll run on it in the next election. Like that's typically not what voters expect that you say, we promise it now and they will actually be, it will be in the budget that they run on in 2027. Yeah, and, I, and I, like I said, I think that there was expectations and now there's the reality of it. So I will say that I would have expected this to be in the first budget. Mm -hmm. that's been preconditioned uh, in the premier's address that we can go to just in a few moments here to see what she had to say um, and dig into some of that. Um, but I, I think it's important that we look at like the, now the, the fiscal reality. And again, you're, you're going into the numbers. It is going to be an election that has happened in corporate taxes of phasing in or, or increasing year over year. So it's not unheard of. But I get, I trust me, I get that frustration. Now, the other thing I think is important by the budget is that it's like um, the words responsible, modest, um, balanced, reasonable, no nonsense. Like these are the types of, I think, words that the government wanted to get out of this. Like it's kind mm -hmm. of a, a business as usual. I think they did a good job on on framing it out and the way that it's landing. But I think it's also interesting that it almost just seems like a 3% increase across the board. And I'm a person where I'd love to see some more um, <laughs> meat or some fat trimming of like departments and, and things like that. So I think that's another thing where I, I, can, I would say I'm critical of, of the budget on, on how each of the departments receive their, their funds. You know, that's I mean, I totally agree. They said responsible enough times that hopefully there are people out there who will believe it is responsible without the 
the fact being that it's actually responsible. It's funny to me because I look at the budget and I see 4.4 increases that are below population and inflation. And to me, if you have departmental spending, especially in healthcare and education, that do not keep up with population and inflation, that's a cut. Like you can't say that you're funding, fully funding education and then not keeping up with population and inflation. But it's interesting to me that on the other side, on the fiscally conservative side, like where, where you say you're sitting, that that's actually, you're upset. You think that's spending too much. Well, I would say it's not maybe the most, strate- like the way I would want to see the strategic spending. Like um, we saw an increase ac- across the board, but this government has also said like, we're going to spend where, like we're not going to have any cuts. That's again, um, Premier's, mm-hmm. Premier's wording herself on we're not going to take, like reduce the services needed. Um, again, I, I also, though, would be very critical of throwing a bunch of money at the problem like we've traditionally seen your peoples do. <laughs> um, and so, like, I, I'm more live within your means, tighten your belt when you have to, treat it like your house, bud- you know, your home budget, and don't overspend. Um, and we do have a fiscal framework that I actually think really held this government accountable to being fiscally responsible, something that... Um, I don't think we would see if we had an NDP government. This would be a year where we'd see the deficit or the um, our, our debt increase significantly. And when you get, you know, three, three, four percent of interest where we're being charged, that also doesn't, I think, solve the problem that your party is criticizing on on affordability and, and making life affordable, not just now, but in the future. I mean, in terms of spending, these are relatively comparable budgets in terms of what was spent under the NDP and what's being spent under the Conservatives. Yep. Like you can say we just threw a whole bunch oh, of money I th- I at think this is too much money. education. Yeah, but I mean, it's not, it's comparable to say like, you know, the NDP would be spending way more. Like would the NDP be fully funding healthcare and education? I think that's probably a given. Um, but I don't think that you would, I don't think it's fair to say you would see the NDP spending wildly more than the Conservatives here. I think what happened is the Conservatives ran on like a pretty spendy budget budget for Conservatives. There was a lot of promises in there. There was a lot of nuggets for people ahead of the election. People mm-hmm. voted on it and then you get into office and there's only so much money, even with oil projected in this budget at $74 a barrel. That's still like a pretty healthy budget number compared to what the NDP had. And you, it's just not enough. It's not enough to deliver everything. And it's it won't be enough to even deliver what's in this fiscal plan. So I want to stop right there because I want to then um, come back to what you said about like making it affordable. Um, this is comparable to an NDP budget and maybe get into like where you think that the NDP would spend because Rachel Notley, who we'll throw to a clip right now, gave her response saying kind of similar, but some things that I think uh, maybe contrast what you were talking about. Today's budget did not deliver the affordability that families need. It did not deliver any plan on how to fix the chaotic mess the UCP has made of our health care or address the crushing pressures the UCP have put on our schools. And what's worse, this budget proves that while Albertans acutely understand inflation, Danielle Smith does not. Smith's own budget numbers say inflation and population are at 6.2%, but services are stalled at 3.9, if that. That means for everyday Albertans, services just won't be there when they're needed. Okay, so the question... Okay, explain to me where I disagree with Rachel Notley. Well, it's not maybe what you disagree with Rachel Notley, but the whole idea of like it being comparable to if we had an NDP government, like from a spending standpoint Mm -hmm. but then you also said well yeah but you guys don't match inflation and what Rachel Mm -hmm. also said you don't match inflation population growth so what Mm -hmm. I'm hearing is it's actually not comparable you would spend way more and well I'm saying trim the fat like we 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 blew up AHS like the the UCB blew it up I'm still waiting to find out where that the 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 money savings is from that right and how that's going to work because that's something I'm also critical of is like we just gave more money to healthcare. We've always said that we spend too much and get so little on return. I think there's more, especially from a department level, like the public service world, where there could be some more cutting so that the the three percent is actually going to or three point nine percent is actually going to the places that it needs to go. Okay, so I'm not saying like I was talking about overall spending. If you look at overall spending, I think these budgets are it's similar to the level of spending that the NDP was spending at 2015, 2019. 
What I think would be different is the way that funding is allocated. And I don't have a list of everything that would be different here. I think we saw that in the election. Um, but I know that the NDP would be fully funding healthcare and education. It's something that we ran on. It's something that we governed on. It was a priority. So when you look at your budget and you say, we have this much money, where are we going to allocate it? The NDP's priorities are the public services that everybody relies on. Now, I, obviously, this is something that the UCP cares about. It's t it's front and center in their budget, but not fully funding it is not following through with that as a priority. And in the end, when we look at population and inflation growth versus the money going into it, it will essentially be a cut for those services because the, spent, the, the funding is just not keeping up. So I just think the allocation looks different. Uh, under an NDP government than it does under a UCP government. Yeah, I want to grill it or, or drill in. Gosh, I'm struggling today. Drill into um, where Rachel said, like, oh, well, this catastrophic healthcare system. Like, I think that that's a little bit like pushing her her messaging. Like, the PCs, but, the but NDP, Daniel they're Smith a blew part it of it. She blew it up, but like, you can't expect this like 180 to all happen overnight. I think what she was talking about was the actual delivery of of services for the past decade were also a problem and it was this is a problem across the country so i can't really understand why she's like making this all danielle smith's fault because she's actually doing something about it but where would you where would you put the the, the extra money that the ndp would say maybe allocate somewhere else um staff okay but i would put it into staff how? like i like i mean we like we can't get family doctors so how, how do you just like throw money and think that they're gonna like come and catch well, it if you and ask then, like, the move? ucp they'll say they're attracting family doctors everywhere but i mean like it's not just family doctors there are, there's a critical staffing sort of shortage across medical professionals the services that support healthcare in alberta there's a there's a deficit in all of those areas and putting more money into staffing and into staffing up in those critical areas would make healthcare more accessible whether you can get a family doctor or not and but there's no money for that and there's actually to say you're going to blow up an entire organization add four new organizations in its wake and somehow find efficiencies through that seems wild to me like i don't know how you will find money as you add to to uh, the bureaucrats that it will take to operate these organizations yeah but when i think about like where you put that money, let's take UNA, United Nurses um, Association mm -hmm. of Alberta, and they're asking for a catastrophic, unprecedented increase in their, their negotiations. Would the NDP recognize that? Because that's a lot of money for not more staff and frontline services. So I think like, again, I didn't say I, I that this budget knocked it out of the park, but I also think it's fair for listeners to understand that like the alternative would be the NDP. And if we were in the same situation, what can you expect? So w w how, how do you balance that of giving these the nurses association an unprecedented amount while still actually getting more workers and and not just blowing the bank on it well first of all i think it's important to engage in respectful negotiation with any organization that comes to the table in good faith and i think if you look at the i NDP's didn't say it history, wasn't <laughs> if you look at the ndp's history in terms of bargaining when times were tough in alberta despite what you will call close union ties um for the record i didn't got, call it you did <laughs> workers got zeros under the ndp they got zeros because times were ridiculously tight. Oil was at record lows for decades previous, um, and it just wasn't possible. Would that happen going forward at times of peak of, of unaffordability? I don't know, but like it, it's not to say uh, a union or workers come to the table with a demand and someone just checks a box. Like these are thoughtful negotiations that take place. And for many of these people, they're feeling super burnt out after years of working through COVID, after being wildly understaffed, after working through a system that has dealt with a whole bunch of chaos. And it's not all about money. It's about a system where they feel like they can have a healthy lifestyle while, while offering uh, Albertans frontline services where they need them at, to the best of their ability. So I think it's a much broader discussion. And I don't think that the the UCP has considered any of that when they think about how they're funding healthcare. Well, I, I think that, um, again, I, I think when you talk about thoughtful negotiations, I'll just say it right now. I don't think the UN is coming to the table with a realistic or thoughtful approach. So we'll see how, how that plays out. But again, that's something where like, you can't just throw money at a problem. 
the the restructuring of AHS is significant and generational in shifts. Speaking of generational shifts, though, when I, I want to throw us to Premier um, Premier Smith's uh, f- the week before uh, preconditioning or state of the province, whatever you want to call it, uh, budget address to Albertans, and then we can dive into that other <laughs> generational uh, <laughs> topic that she's talking about. Although I'm pleased to report that spending cuts will not be needed to balance this year's budget, lower resource revenues will certainly require us to show more restraint than previously predicted. We will ensure this is done thoughtfully and with priority given to the programs and services Albertans most rely on, such as health, education, and social supports. In addition, promised personal income tax cuts will have to wait a year and be phased in responsibly. So I know that we covered the um, the campaign promise that's not happening this year uh, can still happen in the runway uh, and we'll see how that plays out (laughs) but I want to talk about the uh, Heritage Savings Trust Fund um, Mm -hmm. and and your thoughts on it and then I have some of my own like I think the idea is great Um, I think the idea that we could grow our own wealth fund to be able to support uh, our Alberta's expenses is wonderful. And it would it would stand uh, in the way of any party ever having to run on a PST. Is it realistic? I like on this fiscal plan. I don't think so that this would have to be like, I mean, I, I hope Andrew Leach will be able to offer us a little bit of insight into how much would actually have to go into the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund in order for it to grow to $400 billion by 2050. But I think it would have to be more than two hundred, or sorry, $2 billion in an entire fiscal plan, which is what the UCP is offering to put into it. $2 billion in this next year and then nothing for the rest mm-hmm. of the fiscal plan. And so, yes, let's, you know, in, in Daniel Smith's own address, she says, let's start now to save for the future. If that is really what we want to do, we have to do more than just something today. Like it needs to happen continuously over time. And with everything that the UCP has promised, including continuing to fund public services, including a massive new tax bracket in the out years of this fiscal plan, I just don't see where any of that money could possibly come from especially if oil drops, which in Alberta, it does often. Yeah, the the interesting thing I found on this is I actually think this is like where Travis Taves will leave a legacy in Alberta, and that is around his fiscal framework when he was Minister of, of Finance. And again, putting those, there was um, you know legislation and metrics in place to ensure that governments do this, or you'll have to repeal the legislation. And I don't think that would bode well because Albertans do want to, um, I think we we all believe in savings. And like you said, you agree with this. I think it's a good policy, but I actually agree with you that um, the, the reality of it playing out or a different government, um, hopefully never, but maybe possibly uh, gets, you know, elected to their second term as the NDP. Um, and and how they would manage it, right? Like it has to be this generational shift. The other thing too is that it's an interesting time for the government to do it. I don't disagree with the timing because it is we have to do this now to to provide for the future. And I think a lot of people can get behind that. But um, when you're you know in a place where what does that mean now for me? And the 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 address that she gave didn't really answer what does that mean for my life now because it is a generational shift. Like two of Premier Smith's priorities right now are generational shifts, one in the healthcare system and one in our our savings plan and how we're going to save for our future. And I think that that's harder to tell a voter, as you know, um, what that means for them and what the government has done for them. So my advice <laughs> to her <laughs> is, you know, I think that there it's going to be tougher to be able to deliver on two huge generational shifts and be able to have Albertans actually appreciate the, the the strong policy frameworks that she and the, the UCP have actually put in place. Well, I think ideas are ideas. And what makes this hard for people to understand or put trust in or believe in, aside from the fact that Daniel Smith has regularly flip-flopped on many of her ideas, and it seems hard to believe that we're going to stick to one from now until 2050, um, the hard part is that it's not in the fiscal plan. Like we can say, yes, we're going to dedicate, like, I, I agree, there is fiscal well, framework there is in place that to, says, to give no, but, to, to put but it savings. only says that what the investment income that is earned on Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Stays Fund will there. be reinvested. Right. We need more than that if we want to grow it to 400 billion. Um, and we need incredible spending restraint. And I think yeah. that's going to be really hard to do if, if oil drops. Like we're not talking about, uh, you know, the next year, we're talking about a volatile oil price over the next 
26 years. Um, and and holding to spending restraint to make that happen is going to be really difficult to do. And if you are, if you want to be, and it is brave to be a leader who wants to lead generational change and get Alberta on track, but if that's who you want to be, then walk the walk and put it in the fiscal plan, not just in year one, but in all the out years. And they haven't done that. So for me, that makes it really hard to believe that this is something that they're taking seriously. Meaning that like, because in this budget they didn't go above and beyond what the the fiscal framework has and the requirements of government. Yeah. Um, because they put two billion in this year and then nothing else. Yeah. Like if and, you're and, committed, do it every year. And and I guess I think that's the thing that was the confusing piece of why did you need to, you know, do a, do a pre address about that uh, from a comms perspective. We've both been a part of previous budgets and budget rollouts and things like that. How do you think the premiers um, address? landed what was your takeaways oh like i have like nightmares still about thinking about you know the budget is a giant document and uh the media are always looking you know for a headline one one headline under the budget and in a in the best case scenario it's something that you as a government also want Mm -hmm. um in times of of commodity collapse uh we didn't get great headlines a lot of them were about the deficit a lot of them were about the debt no thanks to you and your team over there um but like behind the scenes you're doing everything you can to get the bad news out first Mm -hmm. and get the get the media and the public to focus on the good pieces of the budget which in every budget there are always great pieces of the budget in this one as well and i think that's what you saw in daniel smith's televised address is to say you know there's bad news coming you're all Mm -hmm. expecting a tax cut and you're not going to get it so i'm going to get that out early hopefully when the budget comes out in a couple of days it will overshadow anything that i've said about this and i'm going to dangle this heritage savings trust fund here as a shiny object that we can hopefully get people talking about because it's a big it would be a big change for alberta if it was real um but I think it was a bit of like, I think when Rachel Notley says bait and switch, that's pretty accurate. Like we're not going to do the tax cut, but look over here at this shiny Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund. This is all about the long term. I think what happened is the UCP didn't have enough money to do all the things that they promised they would do. Yeah, I mean, it was a very heavy ca- campaign promise. That doesn't mean they can't do it within this term. So, you know, in four years from now, hopefully we're still around and we can go go a year by year on on the campaign promises. Um, you know, I, I do want to just get before we bring um, our, our economist on that we just kind of summarize this. So I, I would say on the address, I think that they did accomplish, like you said, getting that bad news out first, the, you know, the 8% uh, personal income tax being deferred to another to another year. Um, I think that they didn't really knock it out of the park when it came to explaining the Heritage Savings Trust Fund. Um, I've spent a lot of time kind of making sure I understand what it means and and what that announcement actually meant because a lot of people can't understand billions or even millions because it's not something that we'll operate with. So I think that there is, the government's going to have to do some more communication on what this means for you. But I will say Minister Horner, I think, did a very good job on framing it out around the responsibility or responsible, you know, responsible spending for a growing population, um, saying that we are going to keep needing to plan for the future and that savings and debt repayment are important. So I would say they did it from a comms perspective. The actual work done um, yesterday was successful. I still don't know if I think in, in a, a pre budget. Um, televised address was necessary or if it could have just been done through an announcement or or something to that effect like I think it was expected to be more than it was yeah um we will throw to our guest uh, in just a minute I just want to get one last point in that I think is really important because in Minister Horner's speech he did say a lot about how uh, Alberta is facing great times ahead, economic great times, the province is expanding, everybody's coming, we're going to have record population levels. And then in the budget, we don't actually fund population growth, which seems wild to me. But I just wanted to point out that contradiction. Well, I bet you we our guest will have some great <laughs> feedback on that. I okay. think he actually had a tweet that he talked about that he didn't love the, the, the speech. So we can ask him about that, too. Hmm. Andrew Leach is an energy and environmental economist who holds a joint appointment with the U of A Faculties of Arts and Law. With more than two decades of experience as a researcher, Leach is also co-director of the Institute for Public Economics at the U of A and is no stranger to breaking down Alberta's government policy and fiscal accountability. So we are so pleased to have you here today, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. 
Maybe we'll just kick things off because I remember, you know, running platforms, running budgets and calling up Alberta's economists and saying, what do you think? Does this all add up and does it all make sense? So maybe we'll just start there with your thoughts on the budget. Well, the, the you know, the usual thing, at least for me to look for is where is the oil and gas assumptions? Where do those sit relative to uh, industry? Where does it sit relative to what corporate uh, reserve reporting is sitting on? And, you know, my reaction yesterday was was it's pretty close. The one that part that was interesting was the strength of the Canadian dollar. And that uh, that drives a little bit. That may be a conservative assumption in this context. But otherwise, we're, we're in the ballpark. There's not a lot of really big assumptions on the resource side. So I think even though the numbers are historically still really high, I think that's just a reflection of the state of the industry, the overall expectations on oil prices, at least in the short term. So in that sense, I thought it was it was interesting um, to see there wasn't a lot of controversy there. On the overall spending side, I think this is where, you know, it's it's probably interesting. Maybe you'll see what Erica's reaction is. But I think it's got to be interesting for the conservative side. I had a little bit of fun yesterday on Twitter with, with Peter McCaffrey, to, who was talking about how, you know, we could wistfully look back to the days of the Notley government and, and the conservative spending approach at that point. So I think that's maybe the one that, that still attracts some lines is, well, if this is a conservative budget, what is a non-conservative budget? <laughs> Well, Erica, you, you'd be you. very happy to know that uh, in our 25 minutes before you were on, um, I said I didn't think that it was necessarily knocking it out of the park, and I would have loved to see some trimming of fat. Um, and I did even highlight, you know, uh, around the health budget, right? We continue to see increases. I'm loving what we're doing with AHS reform, but I'd really like to see some cost, how that, that translates into cost savings. And I don't expect that today, but that's something that's always lurking in the back of my mind. Speaking of Twitter, I did see you, you know, allude to your sentiments on the budget speech itself. So I want to shed some light on uh, your, your tweet. Um, well, not not a lot on the budget speech necessarily, mostly on the fiscal plans. I mean, mm. one of the things that jumped out to me and, you know, small dollars in the total scheme of the budget, but was the way that uh, advanced education was treated. And and I think that's my line in the fiscal plan that I've still read probably the most over and over again, is that all of a sudden cutting budgets and cutting spending on post-sec is value to taxpayers. And, you know, my reaction to that, and, and I think it's a little bit of a shot across the bow to the, the post-secondary institutions, so the universities, but also um, the technical technical schools, et cetera, to say, show us the value, make that case to taxpayers. Why are you there? And and I think that falls on on me as well as obviously on the, the senior admin team. So that was the one that, you know, maybe jumped out at me. I think we'll talk about heritage fund and savings. Uh, the no new, apparently we're not having a referendum on the EV tax. That was, I was waiting <laughs> for that. Uh, but uh, you know, there, there, there's a few fun elements in there and, and a few, I think, challenging conversations for Alberta as well. Yeah, I do want to jump into the Heritage Savings Trust. And Eric and I have had a bit of a conversation about it. Just my feeling on it is I, I like the idea of having this opportunity to get off uh, a dependence on revenues every year. But this plan doesn't seem to me to have the actual numbers in the fiscal plan to get us there. Like, how is it possible? Can we grow the Heritage Savings Trust Fund to $400 billion by 2050 on this plan? Um, well, I guess the the big thing I look at, I, I was just running my running my spreadsheets back a little bit further to see, you know, where were we? Because when you look at the, the tables from the resource revenue that are in the budget, they only look back to, you know, that 2022, 23, maybe 2021, 22, in some cases, where resource revenue was, you know, 16 billion and then 25 billion. And now we're, you know, a conservative 17 to 18 billion. But it's very easy when you look at that table to forget that, you know, we had years, uh, you know, Cheryl, this will not surprise you <laughs> at all, you know, 2.7 billion in 2015, 16, 3 billion um, the next year after that. And so, you know, when, when we talk about getting off the resource roller coaster, right, we're firmly on it. We're just hoping that the resource roller coaster keeps heading in the same direction. But if, you know, if you think of how are we prepared today for the kind of shock that, you know, you experienced uh, along with me a little bit, uh, you know, I was on the edges of it in that 2015-16 period. I just don't think we're, or the COVID period, and I just don't think we're set up for that. Yeah, it's a good point. Like, where do you pull, if you had to, where could you pull 
uh, 12 billion, 15 billion dollars out of this budget. And then and, and hopefully, you know, in a conservative world, be able to tell people that you're balancing. It's a tough thing to do. Yeah. And, um, I, and I think that's the challenge on on the savings is, you know, it's easy to say in the down times, man, it would be nice to have a heritage fund. It's hard to say in the good times, well, we don't need that 15 billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And even if you went with the original, go back to the Lougheed era rules of 30 percent of of resource revenues. I mean, this that's translating to uh, saving over five billion dollars a year right now. So where are we carving that out? Do you want to maybe just take a minute to explain, um, you know, the current fiscal framework that the government has in place and and the reinvestment model, the benefits of that to attract investment, the management uh, so that we can have better, you know, uh, credit rating, we can have better um, borrowing abilities, things like that. And then how how we can elevate it with, you know, what the the net the um the government under premier smith how that also elevates it in the reality i think that's something that like we don't really know how we got here on the whole heritage you just kind of alluded to (laughs) it but then there's the fiscal framework and now we have this another piece so how does that all fit together and what does that mean for albertans well i think the the big line in the in the budget that anybody that's looking at alberta's financial sustainability is going to look at is not so much the net debt they're going to look at the net debt to GDP and they're going to think about what is there in terms of the particularly liquid capital assets, things like the heritage, the heritage fund that could, if need be, be used to pay down, pay down debt. And, and so that bottom line is like page seven in the fiscal plan, our net debt to GDP, we were at almost 10% in 22, 23, by the end of this budget as sort of expected right now, we're down to seven and 7.7%. So the, the fiscal situation is improving. I mean, Alberta's still got a, a first rate credit rating. And so we're, you know, we're going to be in good shape for that pers- from that perspective. It lets us borrow if we need to borrow at a reasonable rate of investment or at a reasonable rate of interest, rather. The challenge again, though, is when would we be in a position where we want to borrow? Right. We'd want to be we want to be able to borrow if things turn south. And if things turn south, it's going to be because resource prices or resource um production, but in this case, prices probably are in the tank. And I think everyone's going to look at this budget and say, we're still very, very levered to um, levered to resources. So we're, you know, sustainable as long as Premier Smith's, the world's always going to use oil and the and the money is always going to be there. And we're going to double oil and gas production. You know, as long as that comes forward, everyone's going to look at Alberta's budget and say, this is sustainable. Is someone going to look at it and say, this is a budget that is resilient to, or this is a, a provincial fiscal framework that's resilient to being off oil. I don't, I, we're not there, but we've, you know, that's nothing new. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about the deferred uh, personal income tax. Um I, we Eric and I agree. share frustration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we share frustration in the fact that we both feel this was promised to come in immediately, and the government has now deferred it to nine percent and and eight uh, percent in the out years coming up to the next election. Um, my read of it and reading some of the commentary on it is even in those out years, there isn't actually the fiscal room to pay for what is a pretty expensive promise. So maybe your thoughts on the deferral and whether it's reasonable for the government to even bring this in at the end end years of this term well i think this is you know the part that we never want to talk about in alberta in terms of the balancing the budget is government policy controls both sides of this equation they control the expense side and they control the revenue side and we have uh by far the most sort of aggressive fiscal policy regime on most fronts or maybe us in bc on some income tax brackets are comparable but when you add up the the overall picture of sales taxes income tax corporate taxes etc alberta's still um by we're, we're far below what might be an average tax treatment in the country and if we keep cutting away from that then that's the other side of the the challenge of kind of the resource roller coaster as we you know, how are we going to pay for that promise? We're essentially paying for it through resource revenue. And if you look at the 20, you know, look at the 26, 27 budget line and say, do we have room in there for, um, you know, do we have room in there for that size of a policy, whatever it is? And the answer is probably, you know, maybe on that straight budget surplus, sure, but not in a way where your re- that targets resilient to a drop in resource revenue. So we, 
you know, if you're going to say we're off the resource roller coaster and yet we have this great, you know, way to spend the resource money if it happens to be there the year before the election, you're not off the resource <laughs> roller coaster. I need we need like Trevor's little graph that has the actual roller coaster on it is is perfectly suited for this. That's actually kind of funny because we were talking about, you know, Premier Smith's generational policies that she's kind of introduced and um I think it just means that we should elect her for a second term to be able to fully execute these. Uh, maybe that's the play Talking. we'll make. That's, 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 when was the, I'm having a hard time remembering here. When was the last time a conservative premier made it to a second election? Uh, sometimes our parties I mean, do. It's, it's, uh, it's, that could be like also like federal. Uh, Stephen uh, Harper that, federally uh, did real well. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm thinking we're we're back to Premier Klein, aren't we? So when yeah. uh, a Premier contested two elections. I don't know what that has to do with Stelmat. the budget, Mr. Leach. <laughs> we're, we're, but yeah. just but not I'm taking so, up on I'm, this, but I, I'm but also sorry. Um, it's no, we it's, like it's, I'm it's, enjoying the NDP in fighting right now. It's okay. I'll just But it's like if only if only conservative governments had had multiple terms in a row to get Alberta's finances back on track. If only, then maybe we would all be in a much if different only position. Today. We were at a place where we're pay- I, our debt is what the end now, what the NDP gave us in four years, Miss Cheryl. I like <laughs> I, I, I like the back and forth, but I do think there's an important part here. Eric and I, <laughs> like, ta- we talked about this too. earlier, yeah. right? Where you think of who our premiers are, who are revered, and who our premiers are, who are, shall we say, less popular. And if you look at Alberta resource revenue, sort of real inflation adjusted per capita, that's a really good signal for who are our best premiers. Premier Lougheed, like 10 plus percent growth year over year through his whole term in real resource revenues per capita. Premier Klein, second half of his term, 9%. You know, you get the debt paid in full sign and all of that stuff. Um, and then you look at, you know, Premier Stelmack, Premier Kenny, um, Premier Notley, and all of them, Premier Redford even, were in this boat where they were on the wrong side of the resource roller coaster, where the real revenue per capita was declining. And they had to sort of offer Albertans that trade-off that they always want more services better stuff with lower taxes and you know everyone looks at Klein and Lawhead and say well look they pulled this off but you know Premier Getty etc well no couldn't make it happen they couldn't deliver that magic and it was because you were on the down slope of the the resource roller coaster maybe we'll get you um to weigh in Andrew on just how you think this government balanced its fiscal responsibility with its social responsibilities because on paper i mean they lean heavily into investing in things like healthcare and in things like education but from my side of the political spectrum i would say funding those below population and inflation um, is actually a cut in the long term and it's not fully funding them and it doesn't to me it doesn't read as a priority erica reads that differently but would be um happy to hear your insight on it yeah i think you know you really think about it in per student funding at the you know in the elementary schools for example where you know we're, we're funding dollars into teaching resources the teaching resource that you get per dollar is going to be lower as inflation wage growth etc happens you're putting more kids in schools you have more cap total capital costs and so you can't look at the at the straight nominal value the dollar term that we uh, that we assign to it you just don't get the same value per dollar spent other places where there's more techno- uh, technological changes that are maybe you, maybe you do have some opportunities for that. But when it's like when you really care fundamentally about that level of student contact and student facilities and small class sizes, it's really hard. We see it at the post sex as well, where, you know, we're we're being pushed to self fund more and more as that as that section claimed in the uh, in the budget speech <laughs> or the budget document. And so it's like, well, how do you do that? There's a couple of ways you do it. You raise um, philanthropic dollars, you do it through tuition, um, and or you do it through, you know, in different levels of international student tuition. We're seeing massive drops in international student enrollment. So at some point, there's something that has to give there. It's and it's going to be larger classes. It's going to be less availability of staff and support. It's going to be, you know, buildings that are that are less uh, kept up. And, and the same will be true in the healthcare system that we, you know, you simply can't have as many doctors working for as many hours per patient if you're paying fewer total dollars in the system. I want to just kind of jump to something because I know that 
Cheryl will be very upset if we don't cover this uh, EV <laughs> <laughs> EV tax. Um, but I, I want to get your thoughts on that specifically and what message that's saying um, about like, you know, we're getting off this revenue roller coaster, but then uh, the alternative resources, like what message is that sending to both investment and to the the economists or business sector of the world? And then the second part is just, I mean, we're sh- going to be shocked to hear I hate consumption taxes. Um, but by introducing those and, and some, you know, land title registration levies, things like that, like what what kind of revenue can we actually expect coming off of those uh, to offset some, of, you know, some of the other changes that we're seeing? Well, that, the EV tax, and I'm glad you used the word tax because I, if I recall correctly, <laughs> the the promise in the Because I don't follow key messages election. anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the. the it's not a user fee or a fee of some sort of levy, uh, but I, I I think the the election campaign was you know no new taxes without a referendum, and so uh, you know as much as we love referenda in this province, maybe we can uh, have one that gets all the EV owners out to the municipal polls in the uh, in the next <laughs> municipal election. Uh, but you know I I think that like most of the other stuff that that we see in this budget, there's some rationale here, right? If we're expecting EVs to uh, take over at the speed that we've seen, for example, uh, renewable power explode in the province, that uh, you are going to have a change in the in the fiscal framework that comes in to fund uh, municipal expenditures, roadways, et cetera. And so there's a rationale here to have a pay as you go. If you're using the road system, you should pay part of it, whether you're driving an EV or something that uses uses fossil fuels. So I think, uh, you know, for an economist perspective, that's not a bad thing. I think what we'd probably rather have is is a fee that was weight times kilometers through the year. I think that would be the better policy design um, than having something that's based on uh, just the the registration of the type of vehicle. But you know, it is it is getting at something that's that's important that we want to fill. But at the same time, you know, it's just there as a, as a little bit of a stick, as a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of like the reclamation for solar panels is, you know, well, the easy kind of concern troll is, well, tell me, you, you care about the environment, right? You're, you're a good hippie. You care about the environment. Why would you argue that they shouldn't be responsible for this? When in reality, right, if we really cared about reclamation liabilities on land in Alberta, we'd be doing this across all of the resource sectors and having a, a fully bonded system. And so there's just that little element of kind of, uh, too clever by half poking away with, with the EV tax that, you know, I think people will sort of laugh and smirk about it, but the headlines, you know, the headlines around around the country will kind of be again, it'll be Alberta's uh, trying to tax away the future or something. And, and I don't think that's a great storyline for us. It was also um, interesting, by the way, to see that the, the uh, EV growth that the government is predicting, right? <laughs> Premier Smith government predicting 60% year over year growth in electric vehicles in Alberta and predicting like less than 1% growth in oil demand. And so these things it's kind probably of- probably why we need to tax them now. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to keep them out. We got we got to get them before there there's too many of them, before Tim Weiss has four or five of them. <laughs> He'll appreciate that. Shout he, out. he will. He will. He's got two um, now. It, to me, it just seemed like a desperate attempt to generate revenue. Like in a budget like this, I like I remember being there being like, where else can we pull revenue lines from? Where else is, is is realistic to pull revenue lines from? And I think this is just one of a couple of things that, you know, if you want a uh, marginal surplus at the end of the year, um, little things like this help you get there. Um, yeah, yeah I, think, I, I mean, to me, this one is more of a it's it's a signal. I, I expect yeah. and Erica, you could probably well, either of you could speak to this, but I expect this is the kind of thing that you hear about in um constituency meetings and you know we're t- this government that just brought back the fuel tax and so it's an easy well you know you brought back this fuel tax it now i'm paying for there. it what about them <laughs> yeah yeah they're what you, you know what i'm saying that is your that's not going to be a popular thing and i'm glad that premier smith did it but it's not going to be a popular thing to say you know people have very short memory for these things so whether that fuel mm-hmm. tax has always been there it wasn't there six or eight months ago it's there now right and yeah. you know why are you doing this and you know what about the person with the ev and i think it plays a little bit like the heating oil credit that that uh, mm-hmm. or the heating oil exemption that came from prime minister trudeau mm-hmm. yeah the carbon charge has always been there but the fact that all of a sudden there was somebody else that wasn't paying it 
uh, made it sort of stick in people's craw a little bit more. And so I, I, I feel like this is more in that world and maybe a little bit of a, you know, another kick at Stephen Gilbo to get him to tweet something that the premier can argue with. Uh, that's probably <laughs> worth more than the revenue on this thing for the next couple that's of years. That's probably true. <laughs> um, Andrew, we're going to let you go, but first do you want to sure. just, if there's anything else that you're like getting ready to tweet about or anything else that really it's surprised surprises. you in the budget or is getting you like really, you know, uh, worked up over, is there any last thoughts you want to offer? Uh, well, you know, there's, there's a few little things that, that I noticed, but, but I think the, the broad picture is that heritage savings fund, right, is which world do we believe in? And I, and I want to see more of that from the government to say, you know, do we believe we're in a world where 10 years from now, the world's still going to be paying high oil prices, we're going to be producing twice as much oil and gas as we produce now, and we're going to be earning, you know, $25 billion in resource revenue. Um, and is that the world we're saving for, right? I, I'd like to see some consistency on what is the what is the Alberta 30 years down the road that we're saving for today? Um, and I, I used the, the analogy, with, speaking to Erica earlier, of saying, you know, if I look to my students and say, you should really put some money aside now for when you have your high paying job five years from now, they're going to look at me like, you don't seem to understand how savings and borrowing works. You don't understand the permanent income hypothesis. And so I think that's the same is true for the province. I'd love to see that more coherence of where do we think the world is really going on oil and gas on climate, et cetera, EVs, and have a little bit more of that reflected in our discussions around the budget. And for anyone who's looking for a little more background on that exact issue, you have a book. I do, and I even have one sitting right oh, beside me. Oh, look at me. that. We didn't um, plan this between, either. <laughs> between, do, between doom and denial I, I, uh, at Sutherland House. So yeah, there's some bits on this on exactly that question of, uh, you know, where is the world going and that consistency of oil and demand forecasts if the world does or does not act on climate change. Awesome. Dr. Leach, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I've been wanting to do this one for a while, so I'm glad to be uh, glad to be here. Well, before we bid farewell this week, I also want to do a little plug. I know uh, Dr. Leach got to talk about his book. Um, our friends over at Pocket Lobbyist have a newsletter that you can subscribe to for free, but they also have an upcoming webinar that will take place, um, the budget debrief on March 4th at 10 a.m. It's virtual, so go over to pocketlobbyist.com to make sure you subscribe to their newsletter and sign up for their budget debrief. Uh, that is it for our show today thank you for joining for our special friday edition of the budget and we are back to our regular time next week look for new episodes first thing every friday morning on youtube and wherever you get your podcasts the discourse is hosted by cheryl oates and erica barudis follow on instagram at the discourse pod Subscribe to The Discourse on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts.